Lord Rees, um, thank you very much for joining us today here for the Vodafone event series AI and I. It's a pleasure and a privilege to um, host you here in Berlin. Um, apart from holding various titles such as Astronomer Royal and President of the Royal Society, which you've been until 2010, you are a best-selling book author. And your latest book on the future, which has just been published, deals with the prospects of humanity. Um, today we want to discuss the prospects, prospects of humanity in context of artificial intelligence, a topic which has sparked controversial debates on the opportunities and risks that come with such technologies. So if you look um, first and foremost in the potential opportunities, as you write in your books, humanity is facing existential risks, for example, climate change, uh, which we have to deal with in, in the um, uh, current century. So will new technologies such artificial intelligence help us to save humanity last but not least? I think AI will help, but it also brings in new dangers. Um, I do discuss in my book uh, the classes of threats and opportunities which are special to this century. This is the first century in the 45 million centuries that the Earth existed when one species, the human species, can really affect the entire future of the planet. Because there are more of us, we're having a bigger collective effect on the planet through our effects on the climate and resources, and also uh, we are more empowered by technology. And the other point, and this is where AI comes in, is that we are very much more interconnected. Uh, we are used to the global financial system, delivery chains spanning the whole globe, air traffic control, and other ways in which the whole world is connected. And that is a strength in one way, but it's also a vulnerability. And because it, it's such a complex system to control. This is where AI can be very helpful in principle because the thing about AI is it can handle very, very large networks in real time. And so in principle, it should ease the problem of coping with these very complicated structures. Already we've seen that AI can cope with uh, electricity grids, optimizing them, and in other ways it can cope with uh, traffic flows, for instance, and do that better than human beings. And so I think AI can be hugely helpful, but of course there are risks and downsides. And one of my concerns is that uh, although new technology does allow us to all live better lives, we may have a bumpy ride through the century simply because there is the risk that something will go wrong and anything that goes wrong can cascade globally. You can't have a disaster in one continent without it going elsewhere. And we've already seen the amplifying effect which an individual or small group can have via cyber attacks. And those are going to be aggravated, I think, by AI because an AI can do a more sophisticated cyber attack. So the um, uh, arms race between those who are doing these attacks and defending against them is going to go several notches higher as AI develops. So there's a good side and there's a dangerous side. Absolutely. Uh, this is a, um, obviously a good reason for the German government, for example, to establish a cyber defense um, a team at the um, uh, Ministry of Defense mm -hmm. because they are quite aware of these, yes, these risks. Yes, our country is doing the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a, it's a global movement, actually. But uh, uh, let's, let's focus on the risks now a little bit because that's um, um, broadly de debated in, in public here, in Europe in particular. When, for example, when it comes to the negative impact of automated decision-making on humans um, due to biased data. Uh, because uh, artificial intelligence is relying on a lot of um, data input and often these, these data are biased. So how can humans retain the authority over AI decision-making models such as machine learning? Well, it's important that they should because, as you say, when machines learn, they have to learn from some large data set. And if that's a human-generated data set, it'll have biases in, and that's a problem. But I think there's a more serious problem than that, uh, which is that if... Uh, we are going to be sent to prison or recommended for an operation um, or even denied credit, then uh, we want to feel that we can be given reasons for this and can contest them if we want to. Now, it may be that an algorithm can be shown to be more reliable than any human person in making these judgments, but I think that's not good enough. We still feel we would like to feel that we know what the reason is for something which happens to us. And also, we're well aware that even though algorithms are reliable, uh, they can have bugs in them, and it's very hard to discover these bugs in some complex AI systems. And uh, 
face recognition systems, for instance. So I think there are going to be dangers which will um, uh, inhibit the rapid acceptability of AI in contexts where our fate or welfare depends on it. And of course, quite apart from that, we're all familiar with the um, uh, effect on uh, the job market of uh, AI, uh, which will clearly make it easier to uh, mechanize completely certain kinds of jobs. Um, and those jobs, of course, will not be just um, uh, warehouse jobs and uh, uh, routine work, but there'll be many professional jobs, like uh, being a radiographer, analyzing lots of um, uh, uh, x-rays of, uh, of hearts and lungs, for instance, um, or being a lawyer, doing routine legal work, or being um, a surgeon even. These things can be mechanized. On the other hand, there are some um, uh, blue-collar jobs, like uh, plumbing and gardening, which I think can never be easily mechanized because they involve interaction with the real world uh, in a very complex and non-routine way. And they'll be very hard to mechanize because, of course, uh, uh, although computers have immense speed of activity, then they need a whole class of comparable events to learn from. Um, and uh, also, we don't have robots that can interact with the external world. Uh, we have computers that can play chess or go better than any player in the world, but we don't have robots that can move the pieces on a real board as well as a child can. So there's a long way to go before machines can actually interact with the real world. Absolutely. I would love to have actually a robot who's cleaning my house, but I'm absolutely realistic that won't happen in my lifetime, right? So <laughs> well, there's a Roomba vacuum cleaner, isn't there, which is quite good, but, uh, but they can't do the non-routine things. Absolutely, yeah. that's right. Yeah. But I mean, there's also, um, with, when, we, when we talk about labor, there is doom and gloom, right? But there's also a lot of hope because people basically say there definitely um, will be an impact on labor, on the labor market. Yes. We, we can't see how large, how severe it will be. Well, be fairly massive redeployment. Uh, yeah. Some people say 20%, some 40%. Yes. Um, but of course, that needn't be bad news. Um, I think it would be good news if we can move to a high tax economy where the money earned by the robots and the AI is heavily taxed and is used to establish huge numbers of jobs for, for instance, carers for old people, assistance to teachers in schools, gardeners in public parks and things like that. Um, jobs which are actually much more fulfilling than being in a call center or working in a warehouse, but which now in most Western countries are um, underappreciated, poorly paid and insecure, and certainly in England exist in far too small numbers. Um, every old person would like to have a human carer, but they just don't exist. So I think if the money earned by the robots, and which uh, has resulted in jobs in factories and warehouses disappearing, then we could set up some more fulfilling jobs for people, uh, but that will require massive redistribution of wealth. And I could see this happening in China, in Scandinavian countries, but certainly not in the United States. So, I mean, this is the uh, technological optimist scenario, basically, that robots and automation will help us to, um, to redistribute wealth and, and lead to a uh, common well, goals oriented. Will, neighbors, but it still will be a public policy whether we tax people highly. And uh, I think if we still have very low taxation, um, then I think it won't be achieved. But I think it's probably got to involve a higher taxation economy rather like we see in Scandinavian countries, which are already, of course, the happiest countries in the world. Yeah, for good reasons. We've got a, we've got a huge debate on, on digital tax at the moment. Let's see if this will be successful um, in this current legislation period. Um, on um, another question, because you were um, mentioning the, the growing interconnectivity, I mean, Vodafone is a, is a connectivity company and uh, this is how we make our money and hopefully make people happy. But you also said there is um, obviously also a downside to it because it will make social in uh, inequality more apparent to those who don't profit from wealth. Mm -hmm. So how does interconnectivity, digitization impact social cohesion of societies? How do you foresee that? Well, of course, it's it has one effect which can be damaging already, which is that uh, uh, however weird your ideas are, you can find some other people somewhere in the world who share them. And so there is this echo chamber, which means that it's easier for extremist groups to organize themselves without geographical proximity. And that's obviously a downside. And uh, if we combine that with the fact that uh, small groups are far more empowered by cyber technology or biotechnology, to cause real catastrophes. This is something which is very hard to deal with without 
a big tension between privacy, security, and liberty. So we got that issue. But I think there's a special uh, problem, I think, if we consider the poor parts of the world. Let's think of Africa, where the population is growing fast and uh, where most people don't have toilets, but they do have access to mobile phones and maybe the internet. And uh, the population is growing there. It's not at all clear how they will get out of poverty, particularly because the uh, route out of poverty that uh, benefited the East Asian countries, Taiwan and Vietnam, etc., of undercutting the labor costs in the West, won't be available to them because the robots will do those manufacturing jobs. So there's a risk that uh, Africa will stay stuck in poverty. And if that happens, the fact that the one thing they do have is the internet or mobile phones means they are aware of what they're missing. They're aware how unjustly deprived they are compared to the rest of the world. And this is a recipe for massive disaffection. And given that they will know what it's like in the rest of the world and transport is possible, I think that unless something really large scale is done to reduce these inequalities, uh, we can uh, expect um, mega versions of the kind of uh, boat people uh, across the Mediterranean, which we've had already as a context of the refugee crisis in uh, Syria. Yeah. Uh, and this is a really mega thing, but we're talking about a population of Africa which is projected to rise to 2 billion, doubling between now and 2050, and on some projections to double again between 2050 and 2100, in which case Nigeria would have a population equal to Europe plus North America combined. Yeah, uh, this is a big responsibility for um, uh, states like um, in Europe um, to really um, take care that um, access to the internet also means participation in, in economic opportunities and society opportunities. Yes, and it cannot. It can facilitate some jobs, but mm -hmm. of course, maybe not enough in itself. I think one has to imagine that um, manufacturing is, in some sense, uh, um, subsidized in Africa. Absolutely, yeah. But and this is there, there's a lot of going on with regards mm -hmm. to um, development work and investing into yes. um, technological empowerment. Yes, and that's good because, of course, yeah. the more education there is for women, uh, the less likely it is that the population will keep on growing up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's um, get back to um, the topic of artificial intelligence in particular. So. Um, I mean, as far as we know by now, um, that no, might not last forever, but um, artificial intelligence or let's say technology at the moment is not able to reproduce human consciousness. Mm -hmm. It seems to be very far away at the moment. Mm -hmm. But do you think someday, because you link, you are thinking in much larger, let's mm -hmm. say, time frames, do you think someday we will be able to build a human-like machine intelligence? Well, it's difficult to know because clearly we can build machines which can surpass human capabilities in more and more ways. I mean, we've 40 years we've had machines that could do arithmetic better than people, and uh, now they can play games and they can analyze large data sets far better because they work about a million times faster now than the human brain does in doing tasks in uh, arithmetic, for instance. So they have the huge advance of speed. But of course, the way they sense the external world is not necessarily so advanced, and that's going to be a problem. But I think we are going to have to uh, ask the question at some stage, um, if you have a machine which uh, seems to have human capabilities, rather like we're familiar with in some movies, uh, then uh, the question is, how do we react to it? Um, is it just a zombie, or could it be it is conscious? If it is conscious, then of course we have to ask um, what obligations do we have towards it? Because we feel an obligation to ensure that uh, other human beings aren't exploited, fulfill their potential, etc. And even some animal species fulfill their potential. So are we going to have to worry if our robots are underemployed or bored? Uh, this is a, a genuine issue. Um, and of course, um, there are some people, uh, there's a a chap called Ray Kurzweil, who now works for Google, who's a futurologist. He wrote a book called The Age of Spiritual Machines. And he thinks that uh, uh, it will be possible for uh, machines to surpass human intelligence and even for human beings to download <coughs> their uh, brain or the contents of their brain into something electronic. And um, if that happens, then of course you face an issue which has been pondered by philosophers for a very long time. If you say that your brain's been downloaded into some machine, are you happy if you're then destroyed? Will it really be you? 
and what if ten copies are made of it? Which one of it is you? So these questions, which were a uh, philosoph philosophical conundrum, are now really um, issues which practical ethics needs to address. And I think that's a, a new issue. Um, I tend to be slightly sceptical about how fast these things will advance. I mean, there's a range. Uh, if you take an opinion poll of experts, and I've been to conferences where this has been done, and they range from uh, people like Kurzweil, who think that we'll have these machines in 30 or 40 years, um, to people like, for instance, Rodney Brooks of the Baxter robot and the Roomba vacuum cleaner, uh, who say it'll never happen. I mean, he thinks that uh, uh, we may uh, never have extreme artificial intelligence, but human stupidity will be with us for a long time. I, I think the um, idea of um, uh, augmenting our brains by some sort of uh, memory stick that plugs in, which would be great, uh, but whether that can ever happen, I don't know, still less. Do I know whether we'll be able to download our brains or whether um, our personality depends so crucially on our body and our senses and how we interact with the real world yeah. that it would never be actually us if it was downloaded. But I think um, uh, even though I've perhaps stressed rather negative views of artificial intelligence, um, the one place where we have fewer worries and where there's more opportunity is in my special subject, which is space. Because I think... Uh, uh, um, it's very hard to send people into space. It's a very hostile environment for humans. But as robots get better, I think the practical need for sending people into space is going to be eliminated, more or less. And so we can have uh, machines uh, which can um, uh, build large artifacts under zero gravity in space or maybe mine asteroids or the moon without people going there. And now we have uh, robots trundling across the surface of Mars, um, trying to analyze the surface. And now they will miss many things that a real human geologist could observe directly. But the next generation may be just as good as a human geologist. There'll be no need for uh, humans to go for any scientific purpose into space. And I think that what will then happen is that we will have exploration of space by miniaturized robots using all the technology that goes into smartphones today which is far more advanced than has been in any existing space probe because many of them are based on 20-year-old technology. Um, but if people go into space, they will go just as an adventure, not for practical purposes. And uh, uh, my personal take on manned space flies, which I discuss in my book on the future, is that um, if I was an American, I wouldn't support NASA's manned program and I hope that ESA in Europe doesn't have a major man program. The reason for that is that uh, a public body like ESA or NASA has to be very risk averse. We're sending up uh, civilians supported by taxpayers' money and it's got to be very safe. As we see by the fact that the space shuttle in the United States had two catastrophic failures in 135 launches. That's more than um, 135 and less than 2% failure rates. But each of those failures was a big national trauma because it had been presented as safe and they'd sent up a woman school teacher mm -hmm. and all that. So my personal uh, prediction is that it's far better if the public sector doesn't do any manned space flight and leaves it to private mm -hmm. companies like uh, Elon Musk's SpaceX or uh, Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin. Those companies can uh, uh, use new technology using Silicon Valley culture and they can accept higher risks because they would accept or should accept as passengers only people prepared to accept a high risk well, like test pilots or mountaineers or around the world balloonists, people like that. And uh, they're the kind of people who will um, go to Mars, be the first people to land on Mars and uh, Elon Musk himself says he wants to uh, die on Mars but not on impact and he might manage that. He's I think 47 years old now so he might be able to do that in 40 years time. So um, I do hope that there will be a colony of people on Mars by the end of a century but they will be um, crazy adventurers, not normal people. I think it's a dangerous delusion to think that mass emigration to Mars will ever make sense. I mean um, uh, Elon Musk and my late colleague Stephen Hawking talked about this but I think um, uh, we've got to solve the Earth's problems here on Earth. Dealing with climate change is a doddle compared to terraforming Mars. 
So we've got to de deal with that. But on the other hand, I think we should cheer on these adventurers on Mars because um, they'll be away from any regulators and they'll be ill-adapted to where they are and so they'll have every incentive to adapt themselves using genetic modification and cyborg techniques to be more comfortable living on Mars. It's very hostile. And of course, if they download themselves into something electronic, then of course that electronic entity won't necessarily want to be on a planet at all. It won't need an atmosphere, it may prefer zero gravity. And so those entities, which are in a sense our remote descendants, they will go off to the edge of the solar system and perhaps beyond, because uh, if they're immortal, then a long voyage is no deterrent to them. So I see the future of intelligence as being something which uh, um, transitions during this century from something embodied in human brains to something which is embodied um, in uh, something electronic. But uh, my special gloss on this is that I think we should discourage this on Earth. We ought to regulate it very much, but we should wish good luck to people beyond the reg regulations on Mars, and they'll be the pioneers in these new technologies. We are looking forward to your next science fiction novel on, <laughs> on these um, scenarios. Actually, I'm, actually, that's a nice closure of our, um, of our conversation here, Lord Rhee. Thank you very much. And um, I learned and take away that we need to think beyond Earth um, if we want to think about the opportunities of AI. Thank you very much. Thank you very Pleasure. Much. <laughs>